Lewis Burkhoff, The Transmission of Sin. Scripture and experience both teach us that sin is universal. According to the Bible, the explanation for this universality lies in the fall of Adam. These two points, the universality of sin and the connection of Adam's sin with that of mankind in general, now call for consideration. While there has been rather general agreement as to the universality of sin, there have been different representations of the connection between the sin of Adam and that of his descendants. A. Historical Review 1. Before the Reformation The writings of the apologist contain nothing definite regarding or, or respecting original sin, while those of Irenaeus and Tertullian clearly teach that our sinful condition is the result of Adam's fall. But the doctrine of the direct imputation of Adam's sin to his descendants is foreign even to them. Tertullian had a realistic conception of mankind, the whole human race was potentially and numerically present in Adam, and therefore sinned when he sinned and became corrupt when he became corrupt. Human nature as a whole sinned in Adam, and therefore every individualization of that nature is also sinful. Origen, who was profoundly influenced by Greek philosophy, had a different view of the matter and scarcely recognized any connection between the sin of Adam and that of his descendants. He found the explanation of the sinfulness of the human race primarily in the personal sin of each soul in a pre-temporal state, though he also mentions some mystery of generation. Augustine shared the realistic conception of Tertullian, though he also spoke of imputation. He did not yet have in mind the direct or immediate imputation of the guilt of Adam to his posterity. His doctrine of original sin is not entirely clear. This may be due to the fact that he hesitated to choose between traducianism and creationism. While he stresses the fact that all men were seminally present in Adam and actually sinned in him, he also comes very close to the idea that they sinned in Adam as their representative. However, his main emphasis was on the transmission of the corruption of sin. Sin is passed on by propagation, and this propagation of Adam's sin is at the same time a punishment for his sin. Wiggers states that uh, the idea very briefly in these words. The corruption of human nature in the whole race was the righteous punishment of the transgression of the first man in whom all men already existed. Augustine's great opponent Pelagius denied such a connection between the sin of Adam and those of his posterity. As he saw it, the propagation of sin by generation involved the traducianist theory of the origin of the soul, which he regarded as a heretical error and the imputation of Adam's sin to anyone but himself would be in conflict with the divine rectitude. The Pelagian view was rejected by the church, and the scholastics in general thought along the lines indicated by Augustine, the emphasis all the while being on the transmission of the pollution of Adam's sin rather than on that of his guilt. Hugo St. Victor and Peter the Lombard held that uh, actual concupiscence stains the semen in the act of procreation, and that this stain in some way defiles the soul on its union with the body. Anselm, Alexander of Hales, and Bonaventura stressed the realistic conception of the connection between Adam and his posterity. The whole human race was seminally present in Adam, and therefore also sinned in him. His disobedience was the disobedience of the entire human race. At the same time, generation was regarded as the sin qua non of the transmission of the sinful nature. In Bonaventura and others, after him, the distinction between original guilt and original pollution was more clearly expressed. The fundamental idea was that the guilt of Adam's sin is imputed to all his descendants. Adam suffered the loss of original righteousness and thereby incurred the divine displeasure. As a result, all his descendants are deprived of original righteousness, and as such, the objects of divine wrath. Moreover, the pollution of Adam's sin is in some way passed on to his posterity. But the manner of this transmission was a matter of dispute among the scholastics, since they were not traducianists, and therefore could not say that the soul, which is after all the real seat of evil, was passed on from father to son by generation. They felt that something more had to be said to explain the transmission of inherent evil. Some said that it was passed on through the body, which in turn contaminates the soul as soon as it comes in contact with it. Others, sensing the danger of this explanation, sought it in the mere, sorry, 
sought it in the mere fact that every man is now born in the state in which Adam was before he was endowed with original righteousness, and thus subject to the struggle between the unchecked flesh and the spirit. In Thomas Aquinas, the realistic strain again appears rather strongly, though in a modified form. He pointed out that the human race constitutes an organism, and that just as the act of one bodily member, say the hand, is regarded as an act of the person, so the sin of one member of the organism of humanity is imputed to the whole organism. 2. After the Reformation While the Reformers did not agree with the scholastics as to the nature of original sin, their view of its transmission did not contain any new elements. The ideas of Adam as the representative of the human race and of the immediate imputation of his guilt to his descendants are not yet clearly expressed in their works. According to Luther, we are accounted guilty by God because of the indwelling sin inherited from Adam. Calvin speaks in a somewhat similar vein. He holds that since Adam was not only the progenitor but the root of the human race, all his descendants are born with a corrupt nature, and that both the guilt of Adam's sin and their own inborn corruption are imputed to them as sin. The development of the federal theology brought the idea of Adam as the representative of the human race to the foreground, and led to a clearer distinction between the transmission of the guilt and of the pollution of Adam's sin. Without denying that our native corruption also constitutes guilt in the sight of God, federal theology stressed the fact that there is an immediate imputation of Adam's guilt to those whom he represented as the head of the covenant. Socinians and Arminians both rejected the idea of the imputation of Adam's sin to his descendants. Placius of the school of Samur advocated the idea of immediate imputation. Denying all immediate imputation, he held that because we inherit a sinful nature from Adam, we are deserving of being treated as if we had committed the original offense. This was something new in Reformed theology, and Rivette had no difficulty in proving this by collecting a long line of testimonies. A debate ensued in which immediate and mediate imputation were represented as mutually exclusive doctrines, and in which it was made to appeal as if the real question was whether man is guilty in the sight of God solely on account of Adam's sin, imputed to him, or solely on account of his own inherent sin. The former was not the doctrine of the Reformed churches, and the latter was not taught in them before the time of Placius. The teachings of the latter found their way into New England theology and became especially characteristic of the New School or New Haven theology. In modern liberal theology, the doctrine of the transmission of sin from Adam to his posterity is entirely discredited. It, refer, it prefers to speak or it prefers to seek the explanation of the evil that is in the world in an animal inheritance, which is not itself sinful. Strange to say, even Bart and Bruner, though violently opposed to liberal theology, do not regard the universal sinfulness of the human race as the result of Adam's sin. Historically, the latter occupies a unique place merely as the first sinner. B. The Universality of Sin Few will be inclined to deny the presence of evil in the human heart, however much they may differ as to the nature of this evil and as to the way in which it originated. Even Pelagians and Socinians are ready to admit that sin is universal. This is a fact that forces itself upon the attention of everyone. 1. The history of religions and a philosophy testify to it. The history of religions testifies to the universality of sin. The question of Job, how shall a man be just with God, is a question that was asked not merely in the realm of special revelation, but also outside of it in the Gentile world. The heathen religions testify to a universal consciousness of sin and of the need of reconciliation with the Supreme Being. There is a general feeling that the gods are offended and must be propitiated in some way. There is a universal voice of conscience testifying to the fact that man falls short of the ideal and stands condemned in the sight of some higher power. Altars reeking with the blood of sacrifices, often the sacrifices of dear children, repeated confessions of wrongdoing, and prayers for deliverance from evil all point to the consciousness of sin. Missionaries find this wherever they go. The history of philosophy is indicative of the same thing, or the same fact. Early Greek philosophers were already wrestling with the problem of moral evil, and since their day, no philosopher of name was able to ignore it. They were all constrained to admit the universality of it, and that in spite of the fact that 
or in spite of the fact they were not able to explain the phenomenon. There was, it is true, a superficial optimism in the 18th century, which dreamt of the inherent goodness of man, but in its stupidity flew in the face of the facts and was sharply rebuked by Kant. Many liberal theologians were induced to believe and to preach this inherent goodness of man as gospel truth, but today many of them qualify it as one of the most pernicious errors of the past. Surely the facts of life do not warrant such optimism. 2. The Bible clearly teaches it. There are distinct statements of Scripture that point to the universal sinfulness of man, such as 1 Kings 8.46, Psalm 143.2, Proverbs 20, verse 9, Ecclesiastes 7.20, Romans 3.1-12, 19, 20, and 23, Galatians 3.22, James 3.2, and 1 John 1, 8 and 10. Several passages of Scripture teach that sin is the heritage of man from the time of his birth and is therefore present in human nature so early that it cannot possibly be considered as the result of imitation. Psalm 51.5, Job 14.4, John 3.6. In Ephesians 2.3, Paul says that of the Ephesians that they were, by nature, children of wrath, even as the rest. In this passage, the term by nature points to something inborn and original, as distinguished from what is subsequently acquired. Sin, then, is something original, in which all men participate, and which makes them guilty before God. Moreover, according to Scripture, death is visited even upon those who have never exercised a personal and conscious choice. Romans 5, 12 through 14. This passage implies that sin exists in the case of infants prior to moral consciousness. Since infants die, and therefore the, effects of, the effect of sin is present in their case, it is but natural to assume that the cause is also present. Finally, Scripture also teaches that all men are under condemnation, and therefore need the redemption which is in Jesus, Christ Jesus. Children are never made an exception to this rule. The preceding passages, and also John 3, uh, 3, 3 and 5, 1 John 5.12, this is not contradicted by those passages which describe a certain righteousness to man, such as Matthew 9.12 and 13, Acts 10 and verse 35, Romans 2.14, uh, Philippians 3.6, 1 Corinthians 1.30. For this may be either civil righteousness, ceremonial or covenantal righteousness, the righteousness of the law, or the righteousness which is in Christ Jesus. C. The connection of Adam's sin with that of the race. 1. The denial of this connection. Some deny the causal connection of the sin of Adam with the sinfulness of the human race, either wholly or in part. a. Pelagians and Socinians deny absolutely that there is any necessary connection between our sin and the sin of Adam. The first sin was Adam's sin only and does not concern his posterity in any way. The most they will admit is that the evil example of Adam led to imitation. b. Semi-Pelagians and the earlier Arminians teach that man inherited a natural inability from Adam, but it is not responsible for this inability, so that no guilt attaches to it, and it may even be said that God is somewhat under obligation to provide a cure for it. The Wesleyan Arminians admit that this inborn corruption also involves guilt. C. The New School or New Haven theory teaches that man is born with an inherent tendency to sin, in virtue of which his moral preference is invariably wrong but that this tendency cannot itself be called sin, since sin always consists exclusively in conscious and intentional transgression of the law. D. The theology of crisis stresses the solidarity of sin in the human race, but denies that sin originated in an act of Adam in paradise. The fall belongs to pre- or superhistory, and is already a thing of the past when the historical Adam appears upon the scene. It is the secret of God's predestination. The story of the fall is a myth. Adam appears as the type of Christ insofar as it can be seen in him that life without sin is possible in communion with God. Says Bruner, in Adam all of sin. That is the biblical statement, but how? The Bible does not tell us that. The doctrine of original sin is read into it. 2. Different theories to explain the connection. A. The realistic theory. The earliest method of explaining the connection between the sin of Adam and and the guilt and pollution of all his descendants was the realistic theory. This theory is to the effect that the human nature constitutes, not only generically, but numerically as well, a single unit. Adam possessed the whole human nature, and in him it corrupted itself by its own voluntary apostatizing act in Adam. Individual men are not separate substances, but manifestations of the same general substance. They are numerically one. 
This universal human nature became corrupt and guilty in Adam, and consequently every individualization of it in the descendants of Adam is also corrupt and guilty from the very beginning of his existence. This means that all men actually sin in Adam before the individualization of human nature began. This theory was accepted by some of the early church fathers and by some of the scholastics, and it was defended in more recent times by Dr. Shedd. However, it is open to several objections. One, by representing the souls of men as individualizations of the general spiritual substance that was present in Adam. It would seem to imply that the substance of the soul is of a material nature, and thus to land us inevitably in some sort of materialism. Two, it is contrary to the testimony of consciousness, and does not sufficiently guard the interest of human personality. Every man is conscious of being a separate personality, and therefore far more than a mere passing wave in the general ocean of existence. 3. It does not explain why Adam's descendants are held responsible for his first sin only, and not for his latter sins, nor for the sins of all the generations of forefathers that followed Adam. 4. Neither does it give an answer to the important question why Christ was not held responsible for the actual commission of sin in Adam, for he certainly shared the same human nature, the nature that actually sinned in Adam. B. The Doctrine of the Covenant of Works This implies that Adam stood in a twofold relationship to his descendants, namely, that of the natural head of all mankind and that of the representative head of the entire human race in the Covenant of Works. 1. The Natural Relationship In his natural relationship, Adam was the father of all mankind. As he was created by God, he was subject to change and had no rightful claim to an unchangeable state. He was in duty bound to obey God, and this obedience did not entitle him to any reward. On the other hand, if he sinned, he would become subject to corruption and to punishment, but the sin would be only his own and could not be placed to the account of his descendants. Dabney holds that, according to the law, that like begets like, his corruption would have passed on to his descendants. But however this may be, and it is rather useless to speculate about it, they certainly could not have been held responsible for this corruption. They could not have been considered guilty in Adam merely in virtue of the natural relationship in which Adam stood to the race. The usual Reformed representation is a different one. 2. The covenant relationship. To the natural relationship in which Adam stood to his descendants, God graciously added a covenant relationship containing several positive elements. A. An element of representation. God ordained that in this covenant, Adam should not stand for himself only, but as the representative of all his descendants. Consequently, he was the head of the race, not only in a parental, but also in a federal sense. B. An element of probation. While apart from this covenant, Adam and his descendants would have been in a continual state of trial with a constant danger of sinning, the covenant guaranteed that persistent perseverance for a fixed period of time would be rewarded with the establishment of man in a permanent state of holiness and bliss. C. An element of reward or punishment. According to the terms of the covenant, Adam would obtain a rightful claim to eternal life if he fulfilled the conditions of the covenant. And not only he but all his descendants as well would have shared in this blessing. In its normal operation, therefore, the covenant arrangement would have been of incalculable benefit for mankind. But there was a possibility that man would disobey, thereby reversing the operation of the covenant, and in that case, the results would naturally be correspondingly disastrous. Transgression of the covenant commandment would result in death. Adam chose the course of disobedience, corrupted himself by sin, became guilty in the sight of God, and as such, subject, subject to the sentence of death. And because he was the federal representative of the race, his disobedience affected all his descendants. In his righteous judgment, God imputes the guilt of the first sin committed by the head of the covenant to all those that are federally related to him. And as a result, they are born in a depraved and sinful condition as well. And this inherent corruption also involves guilt. This doctrine explains why only the first sin of Adam and not as following sins, nor the sins of our other forefathers, is imputed to us, and also safeguards the sinlessness of Jesus, for he was not a human person, and therefore not in the covenant of works. C. The theory of immediate imputation. 
This theory denies that the guilt of Adam's sin is directly imputed to his descendants and represents the matter as follows. Adam's descendants derive their innate corruption from him by a process of natural generation and only on the basis of that inherent depravity which they share with him are they also considered guilty of this apostasy. They are not born corrupt because they are guilty in Adam, but they are considered guilty because they are corrupt. Their condition is not based on their legal status, but their legal status on their condition. This theory, first advocated by Placius, was adopted by the younger uh, Vitringa and Venema, by several New England theologians, and by some of the New School theologians in the Presbyterian Church. This theory is objectionable for several reasons. One, a thing cannot be mediated by its own consequences. The inherent depravity with which the descendants of Adam are born is already the result of Adam's sin, and therefore cannot be considered as the basis on which they are guilty of the sin of Adam. Two, it offers no objective ground whatsoever for the transmission of Adam's guilt and depravity to all his descendants. Yet there must be some objective legal ground for this. Three, if this theory were consistent, it ought to teach the immediate imputation of the sins of all previous generations to those following, for their joint corruption is passed on by generation. Four, it also proceeds on the assumption that there can be moral corruption that is not at the same time guilt a corruption that does not in itself make one liable to punishment. Five, and finally, if the inherent corruption which is present in the descendants of Adam can be regarded as the legal ground for the explanation of something else, there is no more need of any immediate imputation.